Good morning. Um, it's nice to see you all here this early morning. And uh, you're thinking, well, 10 drawings, how long can that take, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, I only have so much to say. But these 10 drawings are very interesting because they're from his late period. And what we do is the reason we're changing out uh, drawings in the Whitner Gallery up in the Huff, I mean, in the permanent collection uh, side of the, uh, the gallery, is that we change them out because drawings should not be exposed to light for long periods of time. So what we call, they go into rest periods. So we've had uh, three changes in that gallery since we opened last year to accommodate their need to stay in darkness for a little while so they can last for a long, long time. Um, Dolly's uh, late period drawings, uh, Starting between 1937 and 1939, Dali and his wife Gala traveled to Italy on three voyages. Um, these visits gave Dali inspiration to fulfill his creative destiny by looking at the works of the great Spanish painters and studying the concepts of the Renaissance artists. These interests combined with Dali's shift to religious art, his use of mathematical principles, and geometry in his work and his preoccupation with nuclear principles formed his theory of nuclear mysticism, which became the basis of his late period. And it's reflected, of course, in his oil paintings quite well. But I think you'll find these drawings uh, as supportive material of, of interest. Dali's classicism forms the perfect resolution for his surrealist art providing a sense of form and harmony to his contemporary religious visions. The first uh, uh, item that I have, and I'll have uh, comparative pieces of works by Renaissance artists that were inspirational to the drawings that we have in the collection. Uh, the Alba Madonna, done in 1511 by uh, Raphael, and Raphael was a, a, a painter that Dali greatly uh, admired. Um, and Dali was interested way back in the Renaissance when he was studying art and, and school in the San Fernando Academy of, in Madrid. And also prior to that, he used to write articles about various artists for a, a student uh, kind of newspaper called the Studium. So he was interested early on and then returned to it later on uh, after he kind of uh, needed to find another outlet after surrealism to produce artwork. As his wife said, you haven't produced anything yet. And so he decided to uh, forge into this different area of inspiration. So the Ella Madonna is a work that he found interesting. The Virgin Mary is seated uh, with a flowing gown um, and it's compositionally will be the same as Dolly's drawing. You have the baby Jesus on the lap of the Virgin Mary, and next to the baby Jesus is St. John the Baptist in a camel hair cloth outfit. And if you notice um, here, especially some of the details, like the background details, this rock here, the, the shoe, when you go to the drawing and note the sandal, as I say, um, you see that Dali's interpretation of this painting is very similar in the composition of how the female figure is seated. And then upon her lap, uh, though in different positions, is the uh, baby Jesus here, seated in, you can tell by the halo uh, on the head and also holding the cross. And then the figure here is holding a bird, and this represents uh, St. John the Baptist. And you can see the sandal is almost identical to Raphael's depiction. Uh, Dolly's depiction is similar to Raphael's depiction of the sandal that the Virgin is uh, wearing. And this is 19, early 1940s, so he's just out of surrealism. He had done the slave market with the disappearing bust of Voltaire in 1940, so he's very interested in double image ideas and techniques. And so he takes the small bird and incorporates it into this formation of birds in flight. And that formation creates the angelic face 
with the downturned eyes of the Madonna. There's also another Madonna that um, Raphael did. It was Madonna of the Goldfinch. And, and I thought it was interesting because in the original drawing that we looked at previously, he wasn't holding a bird. But in a subsequent uh, research that I did, the Raphael and this particular painting of Madonna and the Goldfinch, the Goldfinch was able to feed among thorns. So I thought it was kind of interesting that Dolly caught that little nuance of another Raphael painting and incorporated it in this one as St. John the Baptist holds the bird in hand there. Ascent into the Sky, uh, watercolor done in 1950. And, you know, when you first look at it, it's very gestural. Uh, this, uh, daubs of paint forming figures that are kind of parading across the paper. And I kind of had to think about it for a while. Okay, what does this represent? What is Dali trying to say? And his fascination with uh, uh, religious subjects, of course, it represents the ascension um, of Jesus uh, to heaven. And this event took 40 days uh, after the resurrection, and it's a particular imagery that is represented quite a bit uh, throughout uh, Christian painting and early paintings. And so Dolly, the figures appear um, to mount, march to the right-hand side of the painting, and then this figure here is quite different from the rest of them. It's a figure gesturing kind of back to the group of angels and usually in ascension scenes there's the angels following him and then also a nod to the uh, the earth earthbound figures and here we have the figure reaching up and holding also a cross representing the cross that Christ died on and then just with four lines four simple lines coming on you feel this radiating light coming in, where possibly representing God meeting his son as he comes up to heaven. Simple lines, very loosely drawn, uh, and Dolly has a very uh, uh, imaginative way of uh, applying these, these little nuances to his drawings. Cosmic Contemplation is a more realized painting, a watercolor and ink, done in 1951. It's, it's quite large, and these are all displayed up in the Whitner Gallery. You can actually go up there afterwards if you'd like. Uh, the, slit, the celestial sky is comprised of a large central cloud in the shape of a dodecahedron. And Dali was very fascinated with that shape, and it appears in some of his other works. Um, it's a 12-sided shape. And you can see it. Oops, sorry, sorry. You can see it here in this area right here, and sort of like almost looks like a big soccer ball. Um, and it, within that are uh, figures <coughs> that appear of saints and angels in ecstasies. Uh, the cloud itself bursts with holes that fragment it and uh, sort of creating a heavenly explosion. The figures of men and angels gather surrounding on the, um, uh, on the mountainsides above a valley to watch the spectacle. And in my research, I found an interesting well, discovery. And it was in uh, physicsworld.com. But we were talking about, is the universe a dodecahedron? And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And that was uh, something they were talking about. The standard model that um, predicts the universe is infinite and flat has sort of changed. And a French group have discovered that the, the model of the universe is based on a dodecahedron, and they're trying to prove that example. So Dolly again, maybe ahead of his time, but a very interesting uh, little article because these appear quite often in his later works. Les Bruettes, 
the wheelbarrows. Uh, wash and pencil, 1951. This is another large drawing. Uh, it's based on the uh, image of the interior of the Panthenon, done in 1750 by Giovanni Panini. And it's a beautiful painting, and it shows this um, dome, uh, the original uh, Pantheon was built as a temple to the gods. It was later converted into a Christian place of worship. Prior to that, though, the dome is uh, has an oculus, which is here, where the light would come in and illuminate the interior of the building, but also was represents the eye of the gods. Uh, Raphael was buried here, and then also Dolly incorporated in this um, interpretation uh, these wheelbarrows floating around below it. Now Dolly was very fascinated with wheelbarrows and admired the uh, romantic and painter, French painter uh, Jean, uh, Jean Francais um, Millet who was from the Barbizon school, and so kind of takes him back to kind of the surrealist period where he wrote quite a thesis on uh, this whole subject of, of Malay's Angelus. Um, so he, again, sort of linking back, but this may have been um, done during the time that he was working on producing the painting that's to your right, which was the Raphael-esque head exploding. Here you see the same pantheon and the oculus where the wheelbarrows have disappeared, the face of the Madonna with her downturned eyes, a typical kind of representation of, of the Madonnas by Raphael and many of his paintings. But here is the Panini uh, piece painting of the interior of the pantheon. So you can see it a little better. Of course, the perspective is uh, more panoramic and a little different, but it's a beautiful building. It's something that the architecture of that building is certainly uh, superior. And Dali admired those types of things when he traveled in Italy during the late 30s. Uh, the Sacrament of the Last Supper, of course, is in, the, in Washington, D.C., at the National Gallery. It's a beautiful, large format painting. Um, here we have uh, the figures at the table, almost in a symmetrical pattern, where the figures on one side match the other side. And then you have the dodecahedron, again represented in this work. Uh, we're very fortunate to have in the collection uh, the two disciples, and that was a study for the figures of the Sacrament of the Last Supper. And um, it illustrates two of the apostles seated at the table. Uh, the and as I mentioned, there's a symmetry to that painting because of the matching sides as they near each other. These figures, rather than representing specific apostles, are presented as an idealized participant, participants in the idea of the dogma of Christianity. Now, Annunciation, Inc., done in 1956, um, I've always been fascinated with this work. Uh, Dali uses such a vibrant... Uh, uh, technique of drawing. It just seems to have a great deal of motion and action to it. Uh, and of course, it, Dali's nuclear vision takes over uh, events of sort of a kinetic energy that this, this drawing has and represents the idea of atomic particles kind of racing about. But within that swarming mass of, of lines and, and, and uh, dots and various things, is an image that is very um, repetitive throughout the Renaissance painting of the Annunciation and how it was depicted. Um, Angel Gabriel uh, is kneeling in front of the Virgin Mary, basically here. And in some instances, in some of the paintings, she, he seems to be rushing towards her. Uh, he's bearing the news that she will conceive a son, Jesus. A dove appears above her head, and that represents the Holy Spirit. The angels extends a, a symbol of a lily, 
which symbolize purity. And you can see that clearly off to the side over here. And also, the, a book lies open on a pedestal here, and that is open to the section of Isaiah, and prophesizing this type of thing, that she was going to conceive a son of Jesus. Now, the Annunciation by Raphael, this is his interpretation, but it has all the same elements. The angel Gabriel rushing in, the dove, the figure, he's also holding the lily, the figure seated, she has the book on her lap. The coronation of Pope John the 23rd, 1958, now, the car, Dolly was pretty much fascinated with Pope John the Twenty Third. Um, in this uh, simple drawing, which uh, is again has this very vibrant uh, characteristic to it, as there's just like little lines and dots and things like that. And of course, again, Dolly's fascination with the images on atomic film, the motions of atoms uh, and protons, subatomic particles, that type of thing. So a lot of these, these drawings have that phonetic feel to them. But there is visions of, oops, sorry. There are visions in this of the coronation going on in this section and here. And you can see it by the cardinals with their mitered hats. But what was interesting, and I found uh, some film footage on the internet. The internet's just fun. Um, and they had film footage of where I say here that this was the last time that the actual ceremony of the coronation took place in the Renaissance splendor that it had remained uh, unchanged for centuries. And that would be carrying Pope John XXIII, who was quite a stout man, uh, around for almost the whole day on this, you know, on the shoulders of priests or bish you know bishops or whoever they were, and they took him to the various altars throughout, you know, Vatican there, and he would get off and go down. He was quite seasick by the time this thing was all over, <laughs> and so apparently they thought that it was a bit more than uh, needed to be done anymore, and so it was changed by Pope. Uh, Paul the uh, sixth, and it was changed considerably after the time, but it was quite interesting to find that out. The drawing, I, I can't, it was cut off in this photograph, but when you see it upstairs, it has a dedication to the Morrises that uh, purchased it, and uh, and is on display upstairs. Uh, and I'm not sure when the the actual dedication was put on there, if it was after, probably have been after the fact. And of course, the Ecumenical Council done in 1960, uh, which was done two years later, depicts coronation of Pope John the 23rd uh, in various scenes throughout the canvas. And I think you can see the white-headed Pope in uh, this area here. Saint Luke, uh, a, an ink drawing, 1959, and. Until I really kind of studied this, I didn't really know what it really was about. You know, was it just about St. Luke? Well, St. Luke, uh, an uh, interesting uh, fellow, um, Dolly did this drawing to start with. Uh, we decided that we're going to take this out of the frame and look at it closer because when I read about the information that we keep in books about when the Morses purchased things, uh, it, it mentioned about it being done for the artistic circle of St. Luke. And on the back of the, the uh, drawing itself is imprinted that, that word. And so the paper was provided to various artists uh, in Barcelona and other areas to produce a drawing that could be auctioned to help support this group of artists and this, this, uh, this organization that was in Bar Barcelona to raise funds. Of course, at this time, in 1959, Dolly was making pretty good money, so he, he wasn't generous to give out drawings. And of course, his wife, Dolly, never liked him to give away anything at all. So Juan Marigal, which dates back to the Marigal Gallery, uh, which handled a lot of Dolly's in the early years, 
uh, he was a Barcelona dealer, asked Ali to donate the work, and he said no, so he had to pay $500 for the drawing, which didn't sell. And so eventually, years later, uh, Reynolds Morris bought it in 1961 for a little bit over that price. Um, but it's a little faint and hard to see, but when you can go up and look at it in the gallery, uh, again, it's very gestural. The, it's almost, you know, the watercolor is just sort of dabbed on, and it looks like maybe the pen nib even cuts the paper a little bit to give it a little sort of directionality. And then in the foreground, and, and it's really hard to see here, is like a little line that looks like a canvas or a pad of paper that he may be drawing on. And there are also little dedications on this drawing, and one to the uh, Circle of Artists, and also um, one that says homage to Fortuny. Now, Fortuny was somebody that Dolly admired, and uh, he was a uh, Catalan artist also. Uh, born in 1838, lived through 18, uh, 18 74, a short life, he only lived 36 years, but he did this large canvas that's at the top of this here, and it's very big, it's 32 feet long, it uh, hangs in the museum in Catalonia, the National Museum of Catalonia, and I've seen it, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing, very detailed, and though Fortuny wasn't a Renaissance artist, he was more of the romantic vein and he used very bright and brilliant colors throughout his paintings and of course the painting was never finished before he died. Uh, it was to illustrate the battle fought near Tetuan, Morocco between the Spanish army of Afri Africa and the Moroccan, Moroccan army in 1860. So a hundred years later Dali does his interpretation of the battle of Tetuan uh, which is this painting here, again, a very large painting done during the time of these large canvases that he's working on. And there's quite a few elements that I won't go into on this talk, but uh, if you look closely, there's the elongated leg coming in, which is very kind of from the surrealist period. Gala is up here at the top, and also down here um, riding a horse with Dali also riding a horse, which he probably didn't ever do, but, uh, and there's all kinds of details. In fact, there's a certain combination of numerical numbers in this painting, so you need to spend more time studying this work. Um, I'm not sure, does anybody know where this is now? I th oh, I know, it's in the NAMED collection, isn't it? I thought it was in the NAMED collection, but I'm not sure. I, I should have wrote it down and I forgot to do that as to the location where that painting is. But it's a beautiful work. And then St. Luke uh, is depicted here. He is known as a patron saint of artists, physicians, and surgeons. So you see him down here, oops, sorry, painting or drawing. He's known for the tradition of St. Luke was he was the first icon painter. He's noted for painting icons of Mary and Jesus. And um, the many artist depictions represent St. Luke uh, drawing the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. So when you see depictions of him, uh, he's usually in this kind of scene, but this was a, a nice uh, interpretation, I thought. And you can see him here working on artwork. Pope John XXIII, referred to as the smiling Pope. His papacy took place from 1958 to 1963, um, and Dali was very interested in uh, his ambition to renew and reinvigorate the Roman Catholic Church through the Second Vatican Council in 1962. Um, he was beatified by Pope John Paul on September 3rd, in the year 2000. And the reason I have this photo here is, please note the ear. The ear becomes something that fascinates Dolly and turns into some very interesting canvases. Here is a drawing in our collection done in 1959, ink, pencil, and gouache, where he's drawn the Pope's ear and he mentions that that, that, that is what it is, because you might not know. 
that it is the Pope's ear. But again, it's just filled with this uh, atomic energy, little drawn zigzags and lines that might appear on atomic film, that sort of thing, all kind of make up this, this uh, frenzied kinetic kind of drawing. Um, Dolly's obsession with the human ear can be traced back to 1933, but in a photo collage called The Phenomenon of Ecstasy, which contains a profusion of images of ears, I'll show you in a second, uh, it was done in Miniature Magazine in 1933. Uh, the ear was taken from a photograph of Pope John XXIII, which I showed you from the Paris Match Magazine in 1950 and it was enlarged and became the basis of the painting The Sistine Madonna, done in 1958. Um, again, as I mentioned, it represents those agitated lines representing atomic and molecular particles. This is The Sistine Madonna, oil on canvas. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's a, a wonderful painting, and you can see the ear here. And then the Sistine Madonna is incorporated within that ear. And you know, the idea of the word of, that the Pope gets the word of God through his ear. So it kind of stems back to that. There's some interesting elements too that relate back to the Bende dots, very similar to the dots that you see in our portrait of our dead brother upstairs. So uh, during this time, it's sort of like a, where he's enlarged the ear from a photo gravure magazine, which he took it from, Match Magazine, and then kind of concealed the Sistine Madonna in there. So see that next time you're in New York. And then this is the Minotaur cover and the magazine uh, I was talking about, and you can see various phases of ears here, along with other things, but here are ears appearing there, so it's kind of interesting. St. Anne and the Infant, done in 1960, is based compositionally on Leonardo da Vinci's, another favorite artist of Dali's, uh, of a painting by the same name. St. Anne is the mother of the Virgin Mary. The Christ child is also represented here uh, at the bottom. Here's the Christ child, but also the Lamb of God, so oftentimes there's lamb is illustrated. So you see the figure here, it's sort of faint, but there's the face and the figure and the hands reaching down. So he gives you enough information. Here he sort of combines it with his inspirations of uh, abstract expressionist techniques that he also incorporates with his molecular or nu nuclear physics studies. And then this is the painting by Leonardo da Vinci of the Virgin and Child with St. Anne. And compositionally, there's a similarity between the two. So that is the end of my talk. But um, if you have any other questions, I'll be glad to answer them for us. And we can go upstairs if you'd like. And I'll be up in the gallery if you want to talk more about these works. Thank you.